Good morning and welcome to Law Talk. My name is Mitchell Panter. I'm an attorney with the law firm of Panter, Panter and San Pedro, and this is Law Talk. Let me give you a little bit of a history as to where Law Talk came from. So about 30 years ago, my brother Brett and I became partners and we started working and we wanted to do a little bit of community service in addition to advertising. So what we did was we walked over to PBS, uh, Public Broadcasting, and we asked them if we could put on a show. So at that time it was TV. And what we did was we would bring in different members of the legal community to educate people, to, to learn. Uh, our practice in our area is personal injury, medical malpractice, but we wanted to be able to help our community. We wanted to be able to help people that had the need for legal services. Fast forward about another 10, 15 years, Panther, Panther, and San Pedro, we are here, we're on a corner, Kendall and US1, we formed a group called the Panther, Panther, and San Pedro Network. And again, our purpose was twofold. One was to be able to help people, and two was to be able to help our legal community by giving them an opportunity to meet people and treat people and do what needs to be done to help everybody. The Panther, Panther, and San Pedro Network is formed. Uh, we have about 150 members in Miami-Dade County and about 50 in Broward. What we do is we are the go-to people. So if you have a legal need, we want to be able to help you. We never want to say, can't help you, don't know anything about that, don't do that. You want to be able to say, we have a member in our group or we have somebody that we know that can help you. This brings us to our guest here, Andy. Uh, Mr. Sapiro is an attorney, well-versed, well-experienced, qualified and competent in the community. So Andy, together with a group of other people came, um, we met them, we spoke with them, we made sure that they were skilled, qualified, competent members in their given field, um, and thus they became part of our network. So what we're going to do over these next few weeks, and we've had a few of them already, is meet specialists, people that deal with different areas of law that can help you. We're going to talk to them about what they do, how they do it, um, why they do it, and what they can do to help you. As you have different questions, you can feel free to join us in the chat, and we'll do our best to try to help you out. So today, our featured guest is Andy Sapiro. Good afternoon. Good morning, Mr. Sapiro. How are you today? Mitchell, good to see you. Let's start with the beginning. Who are you and what do you do? I'm Andy Sapiro. I have a law office in Palmetto Bay. Um, I represent people who have made disability claims. Um, most of my hearing activity uh, is related to social security disability, but I also represent uh, folks that have uh, sought and have been denied uh, short and long-term disability benefits uh, through group employer plans. All right, let me back up and see, first of all, who are you? Where'd you go to law school? What kind of work have you done? And, and where are you currently located? I'm a 1980 grad of the University of Miami law, School of Law. And I've always practiced here in South Florida. Um, uh, I've been located in my office in Palmetto Bay now for 20 years. And um, I'm not hard to find. Um, the easiest way to find me, I think, is to Google disability attorney in Palmetto Bay. And um, when you go to the home page, if you see the lawyer with a mustache, that's me. My, my last name is spelled S-A-P-I-R-O. And uh, you don't need to write this down, but uh, obviously my office has a phone number. That's 786-242-4146. Let me go back again one more step as well. You are one of our original members, if I recall, I'm from the Panther, Panther, and San Pedro Network. I might be. Pretty close to it. How'd you get involved and why'd you get involved? Well, um, I'm going to take a guess. Uh, one of your longtime employees, Sarah Gyro, uh, probably zipped me an email one day about the group. Uh, I've known Sarah forever. And uh, I thought, well, this is a good idea. So obviously I was in touch with you back then and um, uh, always enjoyed the dinners, which I know we'll do again as soon as I guess we can. We'll get out there again. Right. All right. So let's talk about you and what you do. You do Social Security disability. What's the main topic? How, how do you call it? Well, yes, I think that's the best place to start. OK. Um, what is it and how do you do it? There are two types of disability programs. Um, the one that most people are familiar with and that most people will want to uh, learn about if they find themselves with an illness or a condition where they cannot work is the Social Security 
disability. It's, it's a Title II under the Act program. And that program is uh, entitles someone who is disabled to uh, receive disability benefits that are based upon their reported income history. Uh, so if you had a disability or a condition that either prevented you from working or caused you to lose your job, let's say that occurred, let's say it occurred two months before the pandemic began. Uh, you filed a claim sometime several months later after you've um, determined sometimes with consultation with your doctors that it's unlikely that you're going to be able to return to work. You'll file a claim. Well, let me stop you there. File a claim. What does that mean? Who files a claim? How does it get filed? What's the procedure? Uh, there's several ways to do it. The old fashioned way uh, you cannot do during the pandemic. The old fashioned way was to call social security and make an appointment and go to the local office. The local offices are not open for walk in traffic during the pandemic. So you can actually start or start or file a claim uh, by starting uh, by calling social security, but it's a government line and they don't pick up right away, but it's possible to do so. It's also possible to go online and file a claim online. Um, you will be contacted by someone from the local social security office, you'll be interviewed, they will have you sign some forms. They will gather your medical records. They'll have them reviewed and they'll make a decision. Uh, the initial claim decision numbers have been fairly stable over the last uh, couple of decades. Most people, uh, I think I can say that 75% of the initial applicants are going to be denied. Once they're denied, they well, when they're denied, they receive a letter from Social Security. The letter informs them that they've been denied, but they have the opportunity to have their claim reviewed. They go to the second step or stage of the claim. It's the reconsideration stage. And that is a good stage to go find someone like me. Well, let me stop you then. So you're saying that what they do is they do it by themselves first. Is there a way to get you involved first? And would that First of all, is it possible? And second of all, is it beneficial? Probably not beneficial in terms of if you, well, if you're, if you're thinking, is it beneficial in terms of my, the odds of uh, being uh, approved at the initial, at the initial level or the initial stage? Um, well, we don't have a lot in the way of number studies on that because most claims are begun without uh, the help or assistance of an attorney. Um, sometimes uh, someone might, if, if you find yourself in the hospital long term uh, and, you do, and you're not uh, insured and, and you don't have health insurance, uh, a representative of the hospital may be in touch with you and they may assist you in making an initial claim. Uh, but most claims are filed without the direct help of an attorney. So I'm a private individual and 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 I'm hurt or I, I can't work anymore or some, God forbid, something strange happens in my life that prevents me from this. How do I know that I have the right to pursue Social Security disability benefits? Um, usually a family member says to them, says, you know, if you're not going back to work uh, this year, uh, you ought to think about Social Security disability. Frankly, that's how most people learn about it. Okay. I mean, uh, if, if the best way to learn about it initially, actually, is is to go online and uh, go to the social uh, the SSA.gov website and go to the disability uh, section of Social Security's website, and there's a great deal of information um, about the claims process and about eligibility. Um, let me, let me break that down into two parts. Let's first yeah. talk about the, the claims part. Um, so what kind of benefits are available to people under the social security disability program? Well, the first benefit I've mentioned, and that's the title two or the SSD benefit. 
if you have worked fairly steadily in your adult life and the work history includes fairly steady reporting and income uh, for a four or five consecutive year period before you become sick or ill, you will almost certainly be entitled to the Title II, the Social Security Disability Benefit. It's based upon, the amount of the monthly benefit is based upon your income. And there, there, are, there are maximum um, uh, benefit amounts, which, uh, which um, increase over time or over the years as the Social Security retirement benefit amounts have gradually gone up also. Um, so that's for someone who has earned income or been a breadwinner. What about the the that person that works in the home, the That's construction right. worker, the person that works quote off the books? Right. The um, the Title sixteen, the SSI disability program, is designed to provide benefits for people that do not have adequate work income history or work credits. Um, it is need based. So if someone does not qualify for the Title II or Disability Benefit Program, they may present an application for an SSI benefit. The SSI benefits are capped. Uh, actually, the Title II benefits are capped also, but at a higher level or amount. The SSI benefit is capped at, uh, well, it's going to go over $800 with, with the COLA increases this coming year. What's COLA? Um, the, the government uh, looks at looks at things like inflation every year and determines how much money people should receive, uh, either in terms of a retirement benefit or in terms of their disability benefits. And around, around, around about this time of year, actually, I think it was a month ago, maybe three weeks ago, they published and they announced the results of their studies and they let everyone know uh, whether there will be an increase in benefits in the coming year and what it will be. This year, this coming year's increase in benefits are going to be higher than they have been in a long time because the government recognizes that uh, the amount of money it costs for us to go to the grocery store and buy our groceries has gone up a lot this year. Sure. And they predict that it will uh, stay high or go up even more next year. So when you, when you look at your bank account and you see your retirement benefits next year have all of a sudden increased by 50 or 60 or $70, that's why. The, the same applies to disability benefits. But, but back to the SSI. The SSI benefit or the SSI applicant um, is entitled to SSI benefits if they are found to be disabled under the same sets of rules or guidelines that apply to the Title II or disability benefit applicants. Generally speaking, what's that? How, how does one become disabled? I'm going to circle back to that. Okay. The SSI, there's a catch for the SSI applicant, and the catch is this. Um, you are not eligible for an SSI benefit if you do not, if, if that's what you're trying to get, if you lack the income history and the income record. You will not be eligible for an SSI benefit unless the amount of income that's coming into the household, spouses or even adult children, is below a certain level. There has to be a need established. It's a need-based benefit. So it's um, it, it's it's a lifeline and, and it's critical for, for people who, who live in households where there are no bread earners, uh, but not everybody will be eligible for that benefit. I just want to make sure that the, the person that cleans homes, cleans offices, does construction work, but gets paid under the table or gets paid cash or doesn't necessarily report it as they probably should, they too have some remedy available to them. They, they can get assistance. They may. Okay. They may. Actually, if, if, if you see, most of our judges will not hold it against the applicant if they have um, done a job where they have not reported income because they recognize or they understand that um, you're essentially, you're, you're punished by not reporting your income. People choose not to for many different reasons, but when the choice is made and you do not report your income, 
And then some years later, you get an illness uh, and you find you can't work and you go and you apply for benefits. The benefits that are going to be available to you are going to are will only be available to you under the Title 16, the SSI program. It pays less money and it is need based. And the determination for the need actually is rolling. So you not only have to be eligible for the benefit at the time of your application, you have to be eligible for the benefit going forward. Uh, so so um, the SSI program will be available to someone who has worked but has not reported income, but it is limited in the amount of money you get. And, and the critical thing is that it is need-based. So that person may or may not be able to take advantage of the program. Back to the beginning of your question. The, the best thing to do when you earn money, whether you're, whether you're a housekeeper or whether you're an independent contractor, the best thing to do is to report your income. Because that way, you're a happier camper when it comes time to get your retirement benefits, thing one. Thing two, if you do get sick and you can't work, you've got income credits. Benefits. The income credits will make you eligible for the benefit. All right. So let me switch gears on you. When should you open or start a claim? And can a family member or somebody else, a representative, help you start a claim? Uh, it's not unusual for a family member to actually uh, start the claim for someone who, for instance, has a mental health problem uh, and mental health problems or illnesses come in all shapes and sizes uh, some people who have rather severe problems may only be partly aware of the nature of the problem um, you know they they may be under a doctor's care they may be seeing a psychiatrist but if they're not getting therapy um, the visit to the psychiatrist's office is, they're not there very long and they don't have uh, uh, long or involved conversations with the psychiatrist who frankly doesn't have the time or the opportunity to do that. They'll get some medicine and they'll go on their way. They may not be fully aware of just what's wrong with them. They may have gone through a series of jobs, but they found that they couldn't keep them. And, and what often happens is, is a family member could be a spouse, could be a mother or a father, or even an adult child will say to them and say, you've got to apply for disability. Uh, and often a family member will start the application process for the applicant. That's, that's fine. Well, when I, when I interview or when I meet with a, with a new client who has a mental health problem, it's, if a spouse has started the application process for that person, the first thing I want to know is how aware my client is of their problem. And, and sometimes it's a young adult and they're just finding their way. And I'll say to them, I said, do you understand that your mother has filed an application for you for disability? Do, do you understand what that means? Do, do you want to do this? Is, is there a stigma of, attached to that? It sounds like it's something that you don't necessarily want to do unless you have to do. Well, yes, there is in a lot of people's minds or views. Um, again, that's not a conversation I often have with my clients because often when someone comes to hire me, they're sort of past that. Uh, that's a conversation they also, they often have with family members and, um, most of my clients have gotten past the stage where they're concerned about the stigma and, uh, it's not something that should, well, here's a dollars and cents reason why you should not, um, why you should not choose to choose to why you should fail to file a claim because of a stigma. Here's a dollars and cents reason. Let's say someone has a mental health problem that's very severe and they stopped working two years ago and they don't want the stigma of having a disability. That's, that's how they think. And so they choose not to file a claim and they're waiting to see if maybe they're waiting to see if they're going to get better and they're going to be able to get back into the work world. 
Well, if another two years passes and they haven't worked, they haven't reported income, but they haven't filed a claim. And then they reach the point where, well, stigma be damned, um, I'm really sick. I've got to do something. And, and they file a claim or a family member helps them do so. If they haven't worked in four or five years, if they've waited, um, they then face a problem with eligibility for the Title II or the disability benefit. Because the disability benefit eligibility requires recent income. So um, someone considering filing a claim who is hesitant to do so for either reasons of stigma or for some other reason, they really need to sit down and talk this through with someone that treats them or with a family member because, or, or with me, because um, waiting, choosing to wait, choosing not to file when you're really sick will cause a series of cascading problems down the line. You know, choosing to wait a month or two, that's not a problem. You know, maybe there's an improvement in the condition or maybe there, there's some hope that, well, I think I want to try and work again before I file. Well, that's great. But if you do that over the course of several years, then you are going to be in trouble when you go to request your, your better benefit, your title to your disability benefit. Well, that takes me to the next area. When should they hire you and what are the advantages or benefits of hiring you? Um, most people hire me after they have been notifi notified by Social Security that uh, they've been denied in the review of the initial claim. They'll get a five or six page letter. Unfortunately, a lot of that letter is boilerplate. But if they do spend the time to read it carefully, they'll see that they've been denied initially, that they have a right to a review. It's called a reconsideration. And uh, the letter the letter doesn't state it. No, I actually, yes, and buried in two or th page two or three of the boilerplate, I think there is a paragraph that says uh, you can get a representative. So, um, uh, uh, but most people have probably figure that out by then. Uh, most of the people I meet have been denied initially and they're getting to stage two and that's when they'll hire me. So um, I, I, there's a What's related- the benefit of hiring you? What, what well, do they get the, out of it? Let me, there's a related question to that before we get to the benefit. Uh, what if you don't hire a lawyer after the first denial? Let's say you get to the second denial and you've gotten to the hearing stage. Uh, can you get a lawyer then? The answer is yes, absolutely. But um, I know from experience that the best time to hire me is during the review stage, the reconsideration, the second stage. Will I still agree to represent someone who has gotten to the hearing stage? Yes, I will. But uh, sometimes once you've reached the hearing stage, other problems occur that are harder to fix in terms of timing. So the best time to get a lawyer is going to be in the second stage, the reconsideration stage. Now, as to the benefits of hiring a lawyer, uh, studies have been done over the years um, showing that the chances for success, number one, the chances for success are the greatest at the hearing stage, the third stage. That's number one. Number two, the chances for success at the hearing stage are better if you're represented. Now, why is that? There, there's several reasons for that. Uh, thing one is um, the cases now are heard or conducted with electronic folders. And the evidence that is filed at the hearing stage is the Social Security no longer expects to have to gather records or evidence at the hearing stage they hope or expect the claimant can do so and one of the things that you hire me for is to file evidence or reports at the hearing stage so the right documents enough documents current not, documents not the wrong documents and 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 when the, at, when the hearing at the hearing stage the wait used to be very long 
I, I don't know if we need to get into the whys and the wherefores, but it used to be well over a year. It's not now. Uh, but claims that uh, are waiting to be heard at the hearing stage for over a year, well, the person, if they're, they have a serious illness or a problem, they're going to be treating for the illness. So new records or reports have to be filed. It's critical that those go into the file. So that's one reason to hire, hire a lawyer. The second reason to hire a lawyer is um, most of the local cases are heard by seven or eight local hearing judges. They are federal disability judges. They are not, they do not come from our pool of state judges. They are federal judges. And these particular uh, federal administrative law judges do not. Notice in the area, you get to know these judges and you get to know how they think and, and, and how, they, how, they, how they rule in different cases. So your representative will know that. So that's thing two. Um, thing three is most people that hire me uh, do so with the thought in mind that they're hiring a lawyer to help them win the case. And, and yes, they are. But a lot of times, um, if you have a good representative, that representative is going to give you legal advice about the claim and be honest with you about the good parts and bad parts of the claim. So a real important role I take when someone hires me, in my view, is to give that person good legal advice. Uh, occasionally, that advice is to be to dismiss the claim. There are problems with eligibility. There are problems with earnings. Um, there are things a person needs to consider uh, in the claims process. And if you have a good legal representative, and by the way, this is um, most of my clients live in South Florida. Most of the hearings I do are conducted either at the Miami hearing office or the Fort Lauderdale hearing office. Uh, I feel strongly that um, South Florida representatives should be represented by South Florida attorneys in these claims. There's many different reasons for that. Um, you're not required to do so. You can, you can go online and you can hire a national firm to represent you. But in speaking with claimants that have gone down that road initially, one of the things I hear time and time again is that they didn't get legal advice in the process of the claim. So I'm talking to someone and there is a particular bad point, weak point or strong point in the claim, or they don't understand the difference between the two types of benefits, or they, they don't know the importance of recent income. And I'm having this conversation with the client and the new client. And if they'd been represented in the past by a national firm, my first question to them is, well, did you have this conversation with your representatives two years ago? No, that's a problem. So let me interject here. Bigger is not better necessarily. You hear oh, it, no, even, no, in, not, even in my field, in, my view. In, in, in my field, in the personal injury field, you hear bigger is better. Well, quite frankly, and I'm imagining your firm too, you have a personal approach, you have a family approach, you know the community, you've well, been here for a lot of years, um, you know what's going on and how to handle it. And if I'm understanding you correctly, you know the judges, you know their likes and dislikes, you know the laws locally. And so family approach, uh, do do what you're supposed to do to help your client. Um, let our family help you and your family. And I'm sure that runs strong in your in your practice as well. That's right. And and if if the representative, if the attorney that represents you doesn't speak with you or discuss your case with you before, say, the day of the hearing. There may be something about your case that the judge needs to know or needs to hear that your representative has no idea what that is. I, I will, if I'm just discussing, it, it's not always about the case, but if I'm just having a conversation with a client, I sometimes hear things that uh, leap out at me that haven't been established or made a part of the claim file. So the judge the judge will take the claim file and review it before the hearing. And frankly, 
most of our judges will kind of decide what they want to do with most of these cases before the hearing even begins. Um, but there may be things that aren't in the claim file that might even change their minds. That, that you that, get because you've spoken to the client and you've communicated. Been communication. There you go. That, that is, That's the word. That is so critical in a disability case. And it's it's much better. It's really communication is much easier to foster when your representative is, say, lives within 100 miles of you and talks to you. So how does somebody hire you? What what do they pay you? What's your pay structure? How do you get paid? What I, I have an issue. I, I can't afford, let alone, you know, to pay for my food and rent. How can I afford you? For most first time applicants, this is how it works. Um, you will apply for benefits. You will be denied if you're in the majority of the first time claimants. And once you hire a lawyer, uh, I represent you on what I think you could describe as a modified contingent fee structure. It's all governed by social security regulations and laws. In other words, I cannot take a fee that the social security judge who's in charge of the case doesn't approve. And what the Social Security rules very specifically state is that I'm entitled to a 25% percentage of past due benefits up to a certain amount of past due benefits. There's but a let, cap. But let me see if I understand this. I don't pay you to do the work. You get a piece of the pie at the end of the day. I do. Okay. Now, I to be clear, I get a piece of the applicant's pie. What happens if the claim is approved? And um, if the claim is approved, and there are past due benefits of um, $20,000. Um, I'm, I'm entitled to 25% of that as my fee. If the benefits are substantially higher than $24,000, if they're, if they're a dollar higher than $24,000, um, and I wish to receive a fee greater than $6,000, which is the cap, I'm not allowed to do so. Even if my client is thrilled with my work, I cannot do so unless I petition and receive permission from the judge who presided over the hearing. But again, so we work in personal injury on what's called a contingency fee basis. Right. I only get paid if the client prevails. True. And the client doesn't owe me any money if True. they don't prevail. True. So I can not be afraid to come to you for your skill and experience because you get paid, I get paid. I don't get paid. It's not my problem. We are both rowing the boat in the same direction. There you go. Yes. And you're working for me and with me to try to get there. Yes. All right. So what other kinds of disability claims do you handle? Uh, there is something called an ERISA claim. Uh, maybe I really should refer to it as a long-term disability claim. These are claims uh, made from uh, disability policies that are obtained through someone's work. Uh, a lot of medium and large employers offer disability claims. The claims are governed by a federal law called ERISA, and um, they are they're handled in federal court. And a person who um, uh, a lot of quite a few of my clients in, in this area came, for instance, let's say you worked for Bell South some years ago, and the, they're gone through changes corporately, but Bell South offered its employees long-term disability benefits. And some, if you became sick and you couldn't work, um, and you would apply for the benefits, the benefits might be denied, and you could hire me to help you get those benefits. You might be approved for benefits initially. You might get them for a year, and then the benefit and all these policies, all these claims are review periodically. They could be denied after a year or two. Same thing. You need to consult with a lawyer. So let me ask you, I hire you, you get me the benefits. Do I need to continue to have you work with me? Do I have to worry about next year, the year after, five years down the road? Um, the claims, the, the, bene the benefits, the benefits are reviewed periodically by the by the disability company or carrier. It might be Unum, could be several others. Uh, they're, they're, they're reviewed on either a, a yearly basis or a once every two year basis. And 
Um, I have had clients who I have gotten benefits for, who have had come back to have hired me again two years later. For the same benefits or a different scenario? Um, well, a continuing benefit at a later date. Now, what happens with most of these disability claims under the federal law, under ERISA, is the disability carriers, when they decide, when they conclude that the applicant, the claimant is no longer entitled to the benefit for one of 10 different reasons, um, it's pretty tough to change their minds, even if you have a legal representative. Uh, plan A, for me, once I've been hired, is always to try and convince um, Cigna or Unum. There's five or six different large carriers that will that will administer these plans. Uh, plan A is always to convince them to put my client back on claim so that they get their benefits on a monthly basis again. But once they've been denied, it's often the case that you'll have to go to federal court. Um, once these claims go to federal court, uh, we are required, the parties in court, it, who's in court is the claimant, their representative, and, and the disability carrier. The parties are required to go to mediation. Uh, plan A is always to try and get the claimant reinstated for benefits. But what I find uh, is that once you get to court, once the, once the disability carrier has decided, nope, they're not going to agree to, they're, they're just, we're going to agree to, we're going to agree to disagree. And you, that's, that's how parties end up in court anyway. Uh, in court, uh, what often happens is uh, there's the possibility of a global settlement of, of benefits. Um, and when you say global, past, present, future. Past, that's present, it. future. Okay. Frankly, the disability carriers, once the case goes to federal court, would prefer that the case be settled. And by that, you mean instead of having to pay you weekly, monthly, annually, here's your lump sum money, you're done. Go away. We'll never see you again. Goodbye and good luck. Um, which, frankly, is not great for some claimants. However, however, if the carrier is willing to offer a reasonable amount of future benefits as part of a claim settlement, it's something that sometimes is to the claimant's advantage. But it's also important for them to have a skilled, qualified, competent attorney that can help them with that. I know in our personal injury cases, we sometimes have a client that recovers a large amount of money and helping them manage that money, helping them structure it so that they have insurance, a positive flow of income for the rest of their life, benefits and protection. Those are the kind of services that number one, through our Panther, Panther and Sun Pedro network, we have other lawyers that work in those given fields that can help. And you and your years and years of experience experience can also help the client so that they don't blow that money so that they're protected for the rest of their life. And that's an important aspect that you, the personal family lawyer, as compared to the national lawyer, will do much better for the client, right? Yes. And we'll, look, listen, we'll always pick up a phone for a former client. Um, uh, sometimes though, in disability case, well, that's no, oftentimes in a disability case, if a disability case is, uh, if the injury of the condition is severe or serious and the claim goes to the fourth or fifth year of the claim, sometimes, the, often actually, the claimants have reached the point where they may already be getting Social Security disability benefits. So, so they've actually reached a stage where they have to, and it's often with a spouse's help or a family member's help, they've often reached a stage where they, they know and they're aware and that they need to make plans and that they need to budget. So, uh, but that is part of it. I'm getting out of this. This is a really important aspect. This is something that affects your livelihood, your life, but more importantly, not only you, but it affects your family. Last, why you? Uh, you want a disability attorney who specializes in the area. Uh, there are knowledge reasons for that, and there are practical reasons for that. I'll start with the practical. If I chose in my practice to also represent um, individuals with injury claims, and so their cases would be pending in state court, and the person with the injury claim is given a trial date by a state court judge, 
um, if I am also doing disability cases for others, I'm going to have scheduling conflicts uh, that really cause problems. If a state court judge wants me to show up in court on a Tuesday morning to start a jury trial, and, and you know how long you wait for these jury trials. If, 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 I go to, if I go to the calendar call and I say to the state court judge, I'm Judge Smith, I'm really sorry. I have to do a disability case that morning. The judge will look at me cross-eyed. And, and you, don't want, you don't want a judge in your injury trial at the start of the case looking at you cross-eyed. Uh, and if and by the way, they won't accommodate your conflict. If I say, if I say, well, Judge Jones wants me to do a disability case Tuesday morning, the state court judge will look at you and go, I've never heard of Judge Jones. I'll see you in court Tuesday morning. So let me see You've if I got understand. a problem. This is what you do. You do that. You do that only. That's why I want to come to you. Yes. All right. Because I don't have to be in, 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 in state court Tuesday morning to try a jury trial with Judge Smith and make everybody crazy. So. I want to hire you. Last chance. How do I hire you? Who do I call? What do I do? Um, you can do it the old fashioned way, um, which is pick up the telephone, which is 786-242-4146. You can go to my website, sapiralawoffice.us or .com. Uh, or if you forget all of the above, if you Google disability attorney in Palmetto Bay, uh, you'll go to my homepage. You'll see a lawyer with a, uh, a bushy gray mustache. That's me. All right. I want to spend this moment and say thank you, Andy. I appreciate it. The 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 care and treatment that you give to your clients um, is why you're part of the Panther Panther and San Pedro Network. Uh, we do our best to to help our clients. We do our best to make sure that if we're going to make a referral to somebody else, that that referral is skilled, qualified, and competent. And clearly, you are. And we appreciate that. I want to thank everybody for listening today. Again, if you have any needs with uh, Social Security disability. Call Mr. Sabiro. Uh, again, Panther, Panther, and San Pedro is a law firm dedicated to protecting Florida's families and helping our community. And I want to thank everybody for listening today. Thank you, Mitchell. Thank you, Andy.